So uh, let me uh, let me go ahead and get started. Uh, wanted to thank you all for joining. Um, this is this webinar is hosted by Direct Electron, and it's to hear about our new product called Apollo. The Apollo camera is for Cryo TEM, and my name is Bob Monteverdi, and it is my pleasure to be the moderator for this event. Um, Apollo represents a completely new technology for cryo electron microscopy. And what's new about it is that it employs an event-based sensor technology coupled with edge computing image processing to provide high-speed acquisition over a broad range of imaging conditions. This makes Apollo the, the fastest cryo EM camera available, makes it easier to use, and uh, uh, this has all been achieved while reducing cost. So let me just give a, a just quick description of what you're going to hear about today. Um, the, this webinar will take about 45 minutes, after which we'll have a question and answer session. Uh, Dr. Ben Bomas, who is our Director of Development, will provide the in-depth technical description of the Apollo camera, as well as describing the path we took to develop Apollo. I want to draw your attention that there are several interactive features with this webinar. Uh, please use the chat for questions. So I will be keeping, tap, keeping track of those questions as they show up on the chat. This is a private chat, so what I'll do is I'll, once Ben is finished with his presentation, um, we'll, go over the, we'll go over the questions and provide answers. So at Direct Electron, we design and build cameras for electron microscopes. Uh, that's all we do, that's our business. We are passionate about bringing cutting edge camera technology to leading edge microscopists. At our heart, we are a company of camera nerds, and I think that'll come out in the presentation you hear today. So with that, I will hand this webinar off to Ben to tell you about Apollo. And as a reminder, please use the chat for questions. Uh, on to you, Ben. Yeah, thank you, Bob. And uh, thank you again, everyone, for uh, for being here. We're really excited to uh, to tell you about this new camera, Apollo, that we've been working on for a very long time, um, and uh, describing uh, basically uh, where direct detection has come from, uh, where it is today, and where it's going in the future with this new new camera. So I hope that this is um, uh, helpful for you, not only um, to learn about this new product, but also to get a, a little taste of the history of direct detection as well uh, while we're at it. So again, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat and we'll be going through those after afterwards. So the very first paper uh, showing direct detection for TEM came out in 2004. This was a collaboration uh, between Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, UC Irvine and UC San Diego. Uh, and they were using a CMOS based uh, active pixel sensor uh, to directly detect electrons. This is different than the previous strategy for digital cameras, which was to use a uh, indirect detector that was scintillator coupled. So the electron would be converted to light first and then you'd image the light. That conversion process caused a loss of resolution and a loss of sensitivity. And so there was this big effort to try to find better detectors. And in 2004 was the first use of a new direct detection camera specifically for electron microscopy. In 2007, our company was founded to commercialize the technology that was being developed at UCSD and part of this collaboration. And so our company, Direct Electron, is named Direct Electron because that was our focus, was creating a direct detection camera for the very first time for uh, electron microscopy and specifically for cryo-EM. In cryo-EM, as you know, the, the dose is basically limited on a specimen because of radiation damage. And therefore, any gains that you can get in signal to noise ratio, either by better columns or better cameras or, or whatever else you can do to maximize signal to noise ratio, will have a huge effect because you're already starved for dose. In 2008, uh, a, a paper came out showing for the first time the use of a direct detector for tomography. So this was the first actual application of uh, direct detection cameras in TEM. That first paper in 2004 just showed that you could visualize electrons with the direct detector. This paper showed for the first time that you could actually collect uh, tomography data. In this case, this was negative stain tomography data. But interestingly, in this paper in 2008, they also showed for the first time that you could use the continuous readout from the direct detector to do motion correction. 
And in this case, they were doing motion correction on stage drift, and they showed that they could improve the resolution of final images by correcting the motion, by aligning all these frames from the camera and correcting the motion to correct for stage drift. In 2009, um, the uh, uh, method of electron counting using these detectors was, was published, both by uh, UC San Diego as well as by a paper that came out of the MRC LMB uh, with uh, Greg McMullen, showing that you could identify single electron events on this camera because these direct detectors are so sensitive, you can see individual events hitting, this, hitting the detector. And then in software, you can uh, basically normalize the energy of each of these events and localize them to a single pixel. So you are now counting electrons instead of just uh, showing the entire energy deposited by the electron on the sensor, you are identifying each electron and counting it. This uh, counting method was a, a huge benefit to the field and really improved the quality of data. But importantly, the way counting works is that it's, it's basically a brute force software-based method for electron counting. So we're using integrating mode cameras, that is cameras that read out uh, the, the full, um, full frame with the entire amount of energy scattered by each electron. You read those frames out to a computer, and then in a computer, you perform processing, thresholding, and an electron counting algorithm to identify each event and count it and then create dose fractionated frames or EER frames or however you want to save your data after the fact. But at the heart, all of this is using an integrating mode sensor that is reading out full frames and it just requires that you turn down the beam intensity. So if you have a sparse enough uh, frame, you can do electron counting. If you increase the beam brightness too much, the electrons will start to overlap one another and you'll start missing electrons because one blob will overlap another and you can't distinguish it as two electrons. It just looks like one electron. So that's one of the, the important limitations for electron counting. It gives you much better performance, but at the expense of having very limited um, exposure rate that you can give to your specimen. In 2010, we uh, announced and launched the very first commercialized direct detection camera. This is the DE12 camera. And Direct Electron won the 2010 Innovation Award for Microscopy Today for launching the first direct detection camera for TEM. The first cryo-EM structure with a direct detector was published in 2011, just 10 years ago, from the Scripps Research Institute. This is Bridget Carragher and Clint Potter's group. And they published a structure of Groyel from a direct detector, which was the very first single particle cryo-EM structure published using any direct detector, and in this case, they used the DE12, which is the one that was available at the time. In 2011, also, two other new direct detection cameras came out from other companies. Uh, FDI, now Thermo Fisher, came out with the Falcon uh, in 2011. And similarly, Gatan came out with the K2 and the K2 Summit in 2011. And uh, importantly with the K2 is that the focus of that camera was really doing electron counting. They really thought that that was the absolute best way to collect data and that ended up um, paying dividends later for, for future structures uh, as they were able to take advantage of electron counting. In 2012, uh, we really started to see that direct detectors not only could, could create um, high, uh, or uh, could create cryo-EM structures, but that they could, could create high resolution cryo-EM structures. So uh, Wa Chu's group published the first paper showing that you could approach Nyquist frequency or the theoretical limit of the resolution of the detector using a direct detector, essentially showing that with CCDs and, and the older technology, you had blurring and, and you never got information beyond about two thirds Nyquist. Everything um, uh, at high resolution was so attenuated because of the point spread function of the scintillator, the blurring of the scintillator. With a direct detector, you could get information um, that was resolution on the order of one pixel to the next pixel. So you could maximize the resolution of your structures and for the first time in 2012, we were able to show that direct detection really did make a difference in the resolution of your final structures for cryo-EM. 2012 was also the year that Nico Gregoriev, working again at Scripps Research Institute with the DE12 camera, showed for the first time beam-induced motion and correcting that beam-induced motion using a direct detector. And so this was the first case of motion correction for cryo-EM, showing a dramatic improvement in the data quality 
after motion correction because you can read out a stream of frames from the direct detector and align the frames and correct the motion and dramatically improve data quality. In 2013, uh, we published a paper uh, with a uh, WaChu's group um, in Nature Communications and then also a, a microscopy and microanalysis abstract showing for the first time dose filtering, which is the concept of being able to take an image or an acquisition with a much higher total exposure. And then you use the movies from the direct detector and apply filters to each movie essentially to filter out the, the parts of the signal that it represents damage, radiation damage. So essentially, at the beginning of your exposure, you're collecting data from low resolution all the way up to high resolution. And by the end of your exposure, you're filtering out the high resolution information because that high resolution information with a high exposure is damaged. And so you don't want to add that damage part or that noise. And so you filter that out. So by selectively filtering the frames from a direct detector, you can again improve data quality. And this is called dose filtering and is, is commonly used today. Finally, in 2013, the first near atomic resolution structure came out for cryo-EM using a direct detector. This is from the groups of David Agard and Yifan Chin, and this uses the K2 summit to do electron counting and showed that by using electron counting together with motion correction, they could produce an extremely high quality map. This then launched the resolution revolution, as is uh, quite famous, um, that cryo-EM really improved dramatically in its capabilities due to all of these things with direct detection. And so uh, the growth of cryo-EM since then has really been exponential. And uh, it's been really fun to see over the past 10 years, this tremendous growth, not only in terms of the numbers of people doing cryo-EM, but in terms of the numbers of high resolution structures and very biologically uh, important structures being done from cryo-EM. It's been a lot of fun to be in this field. So in 2013, we were in the situation where cryo-EM was starting to take off exponentially. And it was using three different cameras, three uh, direct detection cameras, the DE-12, the Falcon 2, and the K2 Summit. That was the choice for the cameras. And again, all of these cameras use the same basic technology. And that is that it's a monolithic active pixel sensor that is essentially integrating mode. So it is reading out full frames to the computer and then they could operate with electron counting by turning down the sparsity, uh, turning down the beam intensity, and then in software using this brute force approach to do electron counting. And the K2 was really the one that pushed this idea of electron counting and did it well in the beginning. In 2013, we released the DE20, which was a larger version of the DE12 and also had improvements in our on-chip correlated double sampling method to reduce noise. And so we're getting a little bit bigger and a little bit lower noise. A few years later in 2017, all three companies launched new direct detection cameras. We launched the DE64 camera, which was the world's first 8K by 8K direct detector and included electron counting uh, uh, for the first time in our cameras. Um, and also the DE16, which is a 4K by 4K version of that camera. The Falcon was launched by, uh, by FEI, the Falcon 3 EC. So this was their first electron counting camera and also started including off-chip CDS to further reduce the noise. And finally, the K3 was uh, announced, which eventually included off-chip CDS to reduce the noise as well, and was much faster. So you could turn up the beam brightness a bit more than you could with the K2. But again, all of these cameras essentially represent things that are a little bit better, a little bit faster. So uh, incremental improvements in the camera, no real changes in the overall technology and no huge leap forwards. It's just incremental, little bigger, little faster, little less noise. And finally, in 2019, Thermo Fisher announced the Falcon 4, which again, sped up the camera a bit and introduced EER format. EER is interesting. It's the electron event representation format. And the idea is that if the camera is reading out frames that are mostly zeros, and actually not mostly zeros, but mostly noise, and then you threshold out that noise, so that you end up with mostly zeros. What you're interested in is the individual electron events. And you don't really want to save a whole bunch of frames to disk that just have zeros on it. You want to save just the events so that you have less storage space and you can end up saving your entire data set instead of having to sum a whole bunch of frames together and lose time resolution. 
And so what they've done is they've introduced this EER format, which is a compression algorithm essentially that allows you to save individual electron events without saving the zeros in between. And this is important because again, this is an integrating mode camera where they are creating frames in the computer with a whole lot of zeros. You don't wanna save those zeros, so they introduced this new file format. So in 2020, we were basically at this point where we had uh, we had gotten better cameras. Uh, they've certainly gotten higher signal to noise ratio. They've certainly gotten faster, but it's all basically the same technology. And, and the, the question is, is this as far as we can go? Can we all, you know, is, is direct detection essentially mature? So now we're just tinkering with making things a little bit bigger and a little bit faster, maybe a little bit better software or better compression algorithms or things like that. Well, you may have seen then um, that we, we launched this new Apollo camera, and I'll tell you why that's important in just a moment. But if you're thinking about how to develop a new camera, you'd want to create a wish list of things that you would like. And the cameras that existed in 2020 that were widely used for cryo-EM and used quite successfully checked a few of these boxes, but really didn't check all of these boxes. So the first thing is that you want to deliver extraordinary signal to noise ratio and the cameras that we had before really did that. They, they performed well with the total image quality, but it's not perfect and there's always room for improvement. There's always sources of noise that we can try to address. And so let's try to make the signal to noise ratio a little bit better. We also would like to maximize throughput. There's extremely high demand for cryo-EM. And so if you can maximize throughput, you can do more experiments per day or per week or whatever it is, and uh, be able to accommodate that demand. You can also start addressing even more challenging problems. Specimens with heterogeneity, for instance, demand a lot more particles to be able to create high resolution structures. So if you can maximize throughput, you can start addressing harder and harder problems in cryo-EM. It would also be nice if we could eliminate the constraints imposed by the camera. As I talked about earlier, the method of electron counting using this brute force software-based approach essentially requires that you turn down the beam intensity. And so there's a, a maximum beam intensity that you can use. And it would be nice if we didn't have to worry about that with the detector and it just really gave you high quality images regardless of what the beam intensity was. And then you'd also want the camera to be able to enable new innovations in cryo-EM methods. Right now, all the cameras are kind of tailored specifically for the, the one workflow in single particle cryo-EM and everybody tends to do single particle cryo-EM very similarly in terms of the total brightness, the total um, exposure times, total exposure rates, things like that. It would be nice to have a camera that was flexible enough to enable new innovations in new techniques or new uh, ways of collecting data. And finally, the thing that everybody always asks when a new detector is presented is how much does it cost? Everybody would like a lower cost camera, if at all possible. So this is the wish list. And to respond to this wish list, to try to make the next leap forward, we announced the Apollo camera for Cryo-EM. This is the world's first event-based monolithic active pixel sensor camera. And so uh, I'll describe to you exactly how this camera works in just a moment but we really believe that this camera is going to be game changing for cryo-EM because it really represents a leap forward in the, in the capabilities of, uh, of detection. It's not just an incremental improvement. So 2021, we believe is a milestone year, similar to uh, 2010 and 2011, when the first cryo-EM structures were coming out of direct detectors and similar to 2013, when the first near atomic resolution structure came out with electron counting, we believe 2021 will also be a milestone year showing that uh, direct detection can use a completely new sort of technology and really move the field forward. So the way Apollo works is that instead of this brute force software-based approach for electron counting, what we've done is we've integrated all of that into the sensor and into the, the camera hardware itself. And so Apollo uses a novel sensor that is an event-based monolithic active pixel sensor. It has eight micron pixels and that pixel size is important and we'll talk about that in just a moment. It's a 4K by 4K camera uh, and it also includes on-chip CDS to reduce noise. Uh, it also includes on-chip thresholding. So basically what it's doing is instead of reading out the total charge deposited in every pixel, it's checking each pixel to see did an event hit the pixel or didn't an event occur in the pixel. 
or did a primary electron scatter through this pixel or not? And then it takes all of those events and it encodes those events and sends them out to an FPGA. Now, importantly, we're sending out events to the FPGA regardless of the size of the event. And so if an electron scatters over multiple pixels, we're not registering multiple hits for that electron or multiple counts for that electron. That would be a source of noise. Instead, we're reading out to the, to the FPGA what the total um, interaction looks like of each electron. So an interaction of an electron with a sensor may have uh, funny shapes. It may be uh, one pixel, two pixels, three or four, or however, however many pixels. And we'll look at what those events look like in just a moment. But we then read out those events to an FPGA. One other thing I'll mention about the sensor itself is because we're using on-chip CDS, this reduces our noise, but it reduces our noise in a slightly different way than it does on an integrating mode camera. And that is that essentially we are uh, modifying the threshold for detection uh, every time we're looking for new events based on the reset noise. And again, I'll go over that in a moment. Once the events are read out from the detector and encoded, they're sent to field programmable gate arrays, which are essentially a sort of processor uh, uh, which exists in hardware. And that allows us to do processing in real time, extremely fast. This is run by custom firmware that provides centroiding of each of these events. So it recognizes an event and then provides centroiding of the event to super resolution precision. So every physical pixel is broken up into four super resolution pixels to encode the location of the event. And then for all of these events that are centroided, it creates dose fractionated frames in the camera. So the camera is now not reading out sparse frames to the computer that need to be processed and need to be encoded and compressed and things like that. Instead, what the, the camera is reading out is dose fractionated frames, super resolution at 60 frames per second that are ready for motion correction and ready for processing immediately. These frames look very much like the frames that you would get uh, from the camera, if, if from a, a conventional camera, if you were running in integrating mode, in that each of the frames has sufficient contrast because you can use a relatively bright beam to, in, uh, to be able to do motion correction and actually use the, the information in each frame without averaging multiple frames together. Except instead of these being integrating mode frames like conventional cameras, these are now counting frames. The camera is always providing electron counting because it is doing counting inherently in the hardware. And that ultimately means that the computer is not responsible for doing a lot of processing. The computer now is simplified and, and essentially um, has very high speed data storage so that you can dump this data to disk, uh, send it out over the network for post-processing. Uh, you can use graphics cards on the acquisition computer to do things like particle picking and motion correction and CTF estimation and things like that. So the computer is really not doing the heavy lifting on electron counting anymore. It's freed up for other activities. Because we've been able to integrate all of these things in hardware, we've been able to not only improve the results that you get from the camera, but also reduce the cost. Because as things get more and more integrated, you can reduce the overall system cost for a camera. Apollo is really an elegant and simple camera. Um, that means that a lot of the, the options that are used for other cameras are no longer necessary. For example, there's no concept of a dark reference anymore with this camera because it is doing on-chip event detection. Um, it, the dark reference would essentially just be a black frame because uh, all of the thresholding and everything is happening on-chip uh, in hardware. There's also only one gain reference. You don't have to worry about an integrating gain reference and a counting gain reference or a gain reference at this exposure rate and that exposure rate. The camera is highly linear and it really has just the one counting mode of operation. And that means that you just need one gain reference. Importantly, because you can use a brighter beam with the camera, it also means that the gain reference in electron counting here can be acquired very quickly. So the gain references that we've been acquiring with the camera um, only take about two minutes to acquire. And so we acquire one gain reference per day at the beginning of the day and then use that for the rest of the day. The camera is always counting, so you can essentially uh, choose between uh, regular counting or super resolution counting. There's no concept of different frame rates from the camera. It's reading out at 60 frames per second, and then you can sum frames together uh, if you would like to reduce that, that data rate. 
um, but uh, it's it's a very simple and elegant system. And you may recognize this window as being from Serial EM. The camera is already integrated in Serial EM. It's also um, got uh, uh, integration in Legion already uh, in the JDIS software um, from JOL. And uh, we also have an open API that allows it to be integrated into other software packages as well, if you would like. The timeline for development for this camera was quite long, actually. Because it is a novel sensor, uh, it took a long time and multiple uh, prototypes, including multiple rounds of semiconductor fabrication, to create this camera. Semiconductor design uh, started back in 2013. So that was back when we were announcing the DE20 and when um, the first high resolution counting cryo M structure was coming out. At that time, we started thinking about what would a counting camera look like if we did it in a different way. And so that's when we started semiconductor design. In 2016, we started the design of the firmware to do the on-chip um, or the, the in-hardware centroiding. Uh, in 2018 was the first time we put electrons on the camera and uh, still had about two years worth of optimization. And finally, in 2020, uh, we installed the first beta version of the camera on a Joel 2200 at Baylor. This was a, a, an awesome place to do this initial uh, evaluation of the camera because the 2200 had been used for faceplate development um, years and years ago when Wachu was there. And so it was a nice, um, a, a nice microscope that is not heavily used that we could do a lot of characterization of the detector on. The camera has since moved to a Joel 3200 uh, next door. This is in the lab of Steve Ludke and Zhao Wong at uh, BCM. And uh, that's where we will be starting our first CryoEM data collection. And so if you saw earlier, it said follow us on Twitter, um, you should be able to see CryoEM structures over the next couple weeks as we're collecting this for the first time on the 3200 uh, at Baylor. So the first sort of image that we took from the camera was to calibrate the, the, uh, the, the magnification on the camera. And so we use graphitized carbon and we were able to uh, very quickly get a nice image of graphitized carbon without worrying about the exposure rate. So in this case, I had an exposure rate of 23 electrons per pixel per second. I simply turned on the beam and set my brightness so it covered the, the, the sensor and took an image. Uh, and after motion correction, you can see up to, uh, this is showing physical Nyquist. Uh, we do Fourier cropping typically on the super resolution frames. Um, and you can see uh, that uh, in this case, the magnification was such that the, uh, the, the graphite ring is uh, somewhat close to Nyquist frequency and quite strong. So it, it gave us an indication that we can use a relatively bright beam. We don't have a dark spot in the middle because of coincidence lot loss, and we're getting high resolution from the camera. So what did we do then to maximize the signal to noise ratio of the camera? Well, there's a lot of potential sources of noise on a direct detector. Um, and uh, it includes stochastic scattering on the detector, the, the amount of energy deposited by every electron, which is represented by the lambda distribution, the reset noise and the read noise, and computational errors as well that can affect the results. Uh, a lot of these things have been addressed with electron counting with the current breed of electron counting cameras. But we wanted to try to go a little bit further and make things a little bit better. And so one of the things that we did is we tried to optimize the pixel volume. So as primary electrons hit the sensor, they scatter stochastically across the sensor and that causes the events on the sensor to be somewhat random. That means that there's uncertainty on where the electron went into the detector. If you zoom into one of these integrating brute force uh, based cameras, this is from the DE16 camera, and you look at electron events, uh, we have many small events on that camera, but we also have some larger events and events that are spread over multiple pixels. In this case, this is a streak across the camera. Now the question is, where did the electron go into the sensor if you see a streak? Typically what's done is centroiding. And so essentially you take the blob uh, that's recognized in software um, in, in each frame and you provide, you calculate a centroid or the, um, the center of mass of this. And then to super resolution accuracy, you can, uh, or precision, you can record where the event went in. But it's quite unlikely that the electron went into the middle of this blob, went one way, did a U-turn and came back and, and went the other way. Instead, it's much more likely that the electron went into one side or the other. The problem is you don't know which side the electron actually went in. 
And so we essentially choose the middle pixel because that's the average between the two possibilities. But as you get larger and larger events, as you can see, the uncertainty in where the electron went in increases unless your resolution ultimately decreases. What would be nice is if we could maximize the certainty on where the electron went in. And we can do that by having relatively small events on the detector. So if your events are only a couple pixels in size, that's enough pixels to do super resolution, but not so many pixels that it represents scattering through the sensor. It's, it's more of a cascade of secondary electrons in the sensor. Uh, uh, most of the time. And so if you turn off the centroid encode on Apollo and you look at events as they hit the sensor and what the events look like, you can take images like this. This is a representative uh, segment of, of a readout from Apollo without centroiding turned on. Um, and uh, at 200 kV, you can see that the histogram mm -hmm. shows that most of these events are one, two, three, or four pixels in size. So they're relatively mm -hmm. small uh, events, and that means that we really get tremendous resolution from this camera. The second thing that we wanted to do is decrease the, the false positive rate from the camera. So we would like to be able to see every electron that hits the sensor without also picking up a lot of background noise or false positives. If you have the beam turned off, ideally you would want to see as many zeros as possible. You would want to see basically no signal with no beam. And so one of the ways that we do this is with cor correlated double sam sampling. So a CMOS-based device, the way it works is if time is on the x-axis and the y-axis is the value within a single pixel, a conventional CMOS device, including uh, all of the uh, direct detection cameras except for the ones that we use, which are on-chip CDS that I'll show you in a bit, um, they work like this. You start off by resetting the pixel value to zero then you acquire signal, and then you read out that signal. Then you reset, you acquire, you read. The problem is, is that the reset operation doesn't take the pixel value down to zero. It takes the pixel value down to some, um, some noisy value, some non-zero value. And that noisy value or that reset noise is essentially the baseline upon which you acquire signal. And so what you read out is, the reset signal plus the acquired signal. So you've always got this reset noise added to your um, readout from a CMOS-based device. What we've done on our sensors, including our older sensors as well, the DE16 and DE64, is to use on-chip correlated double sampling. And what that means is that within the pixel hardware itself, once we reset the pixel value, we, we immediately sample the reset value. And then we acquire signal and what we read out is not just the absolute final value, but a difference between the final value and the, the sampled reset value. And so essentially what we're doing by calculating this difference every time is that we are subtracting within hardware the reset noise. Now on Apollo, what's important with this is because we also couple this with on-chip thresholding, essentially we're using this correlated double sampling, the sample of the reset value to adjust the, the threshold uh, on every pixel. So once an event is recognized and the pixel is reset, we sample the, the initial value and we use that to dynamically adjust the threshold of that pixel to look for the next event. So that what our threshold represents is truly the amount of energy deposited by an electron and not just some arbitrary value that can fluctuate based on the noise of the sensor. So if you can minimize noise, you have a, uh, a threshold in terms of the, the values uh, within the pixel, the, the voltages within the pixel. Your background noise essentially consists of this blue histogram and your uh, signal consists of this red histogram. And what you want is that the energy deposited by electrons represented by red is well separated by the noise so that you can effectively set a threshold and throw out all the noise and pick up all of the electrons. Now in Apollo, because we can't measure the energy of each incoming electron, because it's doing event-based detection, we can't generate plots like this. We don't know how much energy precisely every electron is depositing on the sensor directly. We can't measure it directly like this. And so this plot is from the DE64 camera, but it shows the general concept that you want to be able to keep the noise of the sensor extremely low and have signal from electrons extremely high so that you can effectively set a threshold and reject noise without missing a lot of electrons. 
So we've also, in addition to doing this on-chip CDS to dynamically adjust the threshold for event detection, we also do on-chip event detection, which means that the readout from the sensor is now completely digital. Was there an event or wasn't there an event in any given pixel? And that means that read noise from Apollo is also eliminated in addition to reset noise. So for the first time, we've been able to address read noise as well. And that also reduces the total noise of the detector because again, it's event-based. And so the, the, the readout from the sensor is essentially black where there's no electrons and signal where there are electrons. And then these signals, these events again, are encoded by the sensor and sent to FPGAs for, uh, for centroiding and processing. If we turn off the electron beam uh, on Apollo and we adjust the sensor threshold, you can reduce the sensor threshold. And as you might uh, imagine, as you reduce the threshold, you start to get more and more false positives. So the false positive rate is shown here in yellow uh, on a log scale. If we would like to minimize our false positives, the sort of uh, value that we have in mind all the time is one part per million. We would like to have no more than about one false positive pixel for every million pixels read out from the camera. And that means for a 16 megapixel camera, you would get about 16 false positives spread across the camera um, for any frame read out to the computer. And so this is a very low false positive rate. But at that false positive rate where we've effectively discarded almost all of the noise or almost all of the false positives from the detector, so we're not getting false positives. You turn off the beam, you essentially get black images. If you turn on the beam now, the question is, are we detecting as many electrons as we can? And so if you increase the sensor threshold, you start to miss electrons because uh, you're moving that threshold and starting to, uh, to uh, cut off some of the electrons that interact weakly with the detector. But if you lower the threshold, you get to the point where you have saturated the number of electrons that are detected by the, by the camera. Essentially, you set the threshold low enough that all of the electrons that interact with the sensor are depositing more signal on the sensor than the threshold value. So lowering the threshold more doesn't allow you to pick up any more electrons. And because the signal to noise ratio for single electron events on Apollo is so high, when we set this threshold to effectively discard almost all the noise, we have also hit this saturation point where the detector is detecting all of the primary electrons that it can. Lowering the threshold further, yes, it would increase noise, but it doesn't give you any more uh, electrons. You've essentially been able to set a threshold to effectively discard noise and, and pick up as many electrons as possible. But one of the issues that has always plagued electron counting is coincidence loss. And I described this earlier. This is the concept of if you have two electrons that hit the same pixel or nearby pixels at about the same time, it's impossible to distinguish them. And so in this brute force software-based approach to electron counting that all the previous cameras used, you had to turn down the beam intensity so that you could separate individual electron events. If you turned up the beam intensity or moved along the x-axis here, uh, what would happen is you would start to miss events. And so the readout from the camera would deviate from linearity. In fact, one of the, the competing camera companies um, gives this away by the fact that their integrating mode is called linear mode, and then counting is the other mode. And that tells you essentially that counting is a nonlinear technique because as you increase the beam brightness, you very quickly lose linearity. If you would like to constrain your linearity to be no more um, than 5% nonlinear, so no more than 5% loss of individual electrons, no more than 5% coincidence loss, on the first generation electron counting cameras running at 400 frames per second, you would have to have the exposure rate at about two electrons per pixel per second. This is based on the publication by, uh, by Lee et al. Um, in 2013. Now in 2017, as we mentioned, new cameras came out. And one of the things that happens is that it got faster. And so if you increase the speed of the camera, you can now increase the brightness of the beam. And so you jump from two electrons per pixel per second up to eight electrons per pixel per second while maintaining less than 5% nonlinearity. Again, you can use a brighter beam, but as you use a brighter and brighter beam, you get more and more coincidence loss. So your image quality starts to suffer. This is really about as far as we can go with the current integrating mode brute force based approach to electron counting, about eight electrons per pixel per second for maximum data quality. What happens if we change the technology and now we're using an event-based direct detector. All of a sudden, this linearity plot 
jumps up by an order of magnitude. And so we're able to accommodate uh, exposure rates up to 60 electrons per pixel per frame on Apollo with no more than 5% nonlinearity. So this is an order of magnitude jump in the, uh, in, the, in the linearity, essentially giving you an extremely linear response from the camera at the range of exposure rates that you would want to use for cryo-EM. Of course, cryo-EM is a, uh, is a, is a um, technique that is dose limited because of radiation damage. And so there gets to a point where you can't turn up the beam brightness much more and still expect a good quality image, not only due to radiation damage, but to parallel beam conditions and other things like that. 60 electrons per pixel per second really covers a range that you would, you would be able to operate pretty much any cryo-EM experiment in and still maintain an extremely high degree of linearity, extremely high DQE over this entire range without having to worry about coincidence loss. So if we look at the detective quantum efficiency, the overall DQE zero from the detector, we can turn down the beam intensity even down as low as 0 0.01 electrons per pixel per second, so an extremely low beam intensity. And we still maintain high DQE from Apollo because again, the false positive rate from the camera is extremely low. So if you had a high false positive rate or if you had noise from the detector, you would, uh, as you turn down the beam intensity and you got a dim beam, eventually the noise would overwhelm the signal and your DQE would drop off a lot. But because Apollo has very low noise, we're able to go to a very dim beam and still uh, have very high DQE. But on the other side of the equation, we can go to a very bright beam and still have high DQE because this is an event-based camera operating extremely fast to perform electron counting in hardware. And so we have high DQE greater than 80, uh, 85% up to about 60 electrons per pixel per second. Extremely high performance over four orders of magnitude of exposure rates. So if we wanted to take images of my favorite specimen, a line grading grid, I was uh, in cryo-EM in graduate school with WaChu. I always focused on the technology. I never, ever got good at specimen prep. And I have uh, great respect for those who are good at specimen prep because I could never create good thin ice on my cryo-EM specimens. And so what I like to look at, unless someone else provides the grid, is line gradings and things like that because I can just pop in the grid and I know the specimen is good. Well, if I wanted to take an image of a line grading or anything else for that matter at eight electrons per pixel per second with Apollo, that's no problem. I'm operating in counting mode and I can get nice images at eight electrons per pixel per second. But what happens if I want to turn up the beam intensity and still do electron counting? Well, if I turn up the beam intensity to 30 electrons per pixel per second, I still get exceptional images from Apollo without any artifacts very nice um, images at 30 electrons per pixel per second. So a brighter beam still doing electron counting. I can continue to turn up the beam and now I'm at 40 electrons per pixel per second, still getting great images. Can I go even brighter and still do electron counting? Absolutely. Here's 60 electrons per pixel per second. So where is the limit? What, at what point do I start to get a beam too bright on Apollo? If I turn up the beam intensity a little bit more to 80 electrons per pixel per second, so again, well order over an order of magnitude of what the other detectors can do with maximum DQE. At 80 electrons per pixel per second, I'm now starting to see some very faint lines. I'm still getting nice images, but essentially what I'm seeing is that the linearity of the detector is starting to fall off by the time you're at 80 electrons per pixel per second. And so you would probably want to collect a new gain reference at this brighter beam condition if you really did want to operate with this bright of a beam. And this becomes even more obvious when you turn it up to 100, these, these artifacts become a little bit greater. And so again, you're still able to get nice images, but if you wanted to operate with this bright of an exposure rate, you do have some coincidence loss and you would want to do a gain reference closer to this because you're operating in a bit of a nonlinear area of electron counting. So what we recommend with Apollo is to use exposure rates up to 60 electrons per pixel per second. And if you do that, you can use the same gain reference over that entire range. All of these images use the gain reference acquired at 30 electrons per pixel per second. And again, only taking about two minutes to collect the entire counting mode gain reference. Because the beam is so bright, we don't need to, uh, to um, take a very, very long gain reference. It means that you can do this relatively fast. 
This is an interesting thing with Apollo because it introduces a paradigm shift for cryo-EM. Previously, the idea was if you were designing a cryo-EM experiment, the first thing you'd have to think about is the camera. You would think about my camera allows me to take data at six electrons per pixel per second, any brighter, and I start to get coincidence loss. I start to get a loss of DQE. And so I want to limit my exposure to six electrons per pixel per second. And so now based on that number, I'm gonna calculate the exposure time that I need, the magnification that I need based on the resolution that I want, the spot size and the, uh, the beam brightness and all of my other things kind of go back to this one number dictated for, by the camera. With Apollo, the paradigm shifts. The idea is that the camera just works. It almost becomes an afterthought. You don't have to think about what does my camera allow me to do? And instead, you can optimize your imaging conditions for your column or for your specimen or for your method or for whatever else you want to do with the microscope without worrying about limitations from the camera. This is important for single particle cryoEM because it allows you to collect data very quickly with very high quality. So you could use an exposure rate up to 60 electrons per pixel per second if you would like, meaning that you could take data in only a quarter of a second for high resolution data sets. So you're getting maximum DQE uh, and uh, able to collect data at high resolution in only a quarter of a second per acquisition if you wanted to. Again though, Apollo doesn't have a set exposure rate that you must use this exposure. So if 60 electrons per pixel per second is too bright, you can turn down the beam. You can operate at 40 or 30 or 10 or eight or one or 0.1 or whatever you would like because Apollo is highly linear and works with high DQE over four orders of magnitude of exposure rates. The camera really just works and you can set your beam intensity as you want. But this maximum exposure rate is again, an order of magnitude brighter than similar data quality from the other cameras. But Apollo is even better because it has on-chip CDS and on-chip thresholding to maximize your performance. And then again, because we've been able to integrate all of this into a single elegant system, we've been able to reduce the overall cost of the camera. And so that should allow this camera to get into many more people's hands uh, and um, really impact the cryo-EM field is our hope. Besides single particle, this may also introduce the opportunity to develop new methods. So for instance, the idea of continuous rotation tomography has been pushed by people like Grant Jensen and uh, Wa Chu at Baylor College of Medicine. This is a, uh, a data set that was acquired using the DE64 camera on his Talos Arctica operating in integrating mode with the phase plate for continuous rotation tomography, taking data in 150 seconds while continuously rotating the specimen. So it's very high throughput tomography with very fine angular sampling. And there's a lot of promise in this, but in order to really push this forward, there's a number of optimizations that need to happen in order to optimize the stage and, and optimize the exposure times to make sure there's no vibrations from the stage, things like that. With Apollo, you're able to, uh, to do these optimizations. You're able to collect data very quickly. And in fact, you could take counting mode, continuous rotation tomography data in as little as 30 seconds with Apollo and still be operating well within the range of Apollo. So you could keep an army of graduate students very busy with segmentation if you could be taking tomograms in only 30 seconds each. And alternatively, for those who do single particle, you could minimize the amount of time taken on tomography. You could take four hours on tomography one morning and then the rest of the, your microscope time could be used for single particle if you wanted. So Apollo really checks all the boxes on what we want from a direct detector. It delivers extraordinary signal to noise ratio because of on-chip CDS and on-chip thresholding. It maximizes throughput because you can use a relatively bright beam and take images very, very quickly. Uh, and again, because it's all doing this on chip, there's no, um, no post processing happening in the computer or no delays afterwards. It's doing everything in real time, in hardware, and then dumping the data to the computer. It's uh, eliminating the constraints imposed by the camera. So the camera just works. You don't have to worry about the constraints of the camera which not only improves your, uh, uh, optimizes your experiments, but also enables new innovations in cryo-EM methods. And finally, it even does all of this while reducing the overall system cost. So we're really excited about Apollo. We can't wait to see what this does in the field. Um, and I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, let me bring up my... Uh, really appreciate the presentation. Uh, I think it was incredibly interesting and uh, did a good job of explaining uh, what's new about Apollo.
So uh, there are some questions now that are coming up on on the chat, um, and so I want to so I want to address those. Um, one of the questions is, uh, can you get the raw electron centroids um, as, instead of the uh, the dose fractionated frames at 60 frames a second? So can you see the individual events? Yeah, so um, with Apollo, because um, of the extremely high data rate of the sensor, it's not possible to stream all of the events to the computer um, with the, uh, the connection to the computer. It's essentially an, an incredibly high data rate in hardware. And so that's one of the reasons that we had to do centroiding in firmware is so that we can keep up with the data rate of the camera. Um, the way that you can see individual blobs from the sensor is essentially to read out a, a sample. So um, you um, you read out some events and you basically just discard other events. So for a dose sensitive technique like cryo EM, um, that's not something you'd want to do because you're, you're missing events. Uh, but for evaluating the camera, seeing what blobs look like, things like that, you can read out some raw frames and see what events look like uh, on the camera. Um, but uh, really to keep up with the data rate of the camera, um, that all of this has to be okay. done. So in other words, to get the benefit of the speed, uh, the, the events need to be merged and formed into the uh, dose fractionated frames on the camera. Right. So you can you can see the events, but yeah, I mean the other way. The benefit, be, yes, the other way to do it would be to reduce the beam intensity dramatically, and so each of your dose fractionated frames would be a sparse can frame. Get now. back to where you. Um, which is back to where the, the current okay. current cameras. Uh, another question is uh, a question that says on chip thresholding means you cannot measure the intensity distribution within a blob caused by an incident electron. Uh, doesn't this harm yes. electron localization? Yeah. So um, it turns out that it doesn't really, um, because uh, if you have relatively small events uh, based on the MTF calculations that we've done. Um, when you do uh, when you do this centroiding, um, the the centroiding uh, just takes into account the the number of pixels that the the electron went into, um, and not the overall intensity of each pixel. The problem is with these detectors is that not only the 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 electron itself stochastically scatters through the sensor, but all of the secondary electrons that are generated also stochastically scatter as they diffuse through the sensor, and that means that the overall intensity is not incredibly trustworthy uh, because the, the, the distribution is happening randomly in the sensor as the event is hitting. And so we're finding that you can actually discard that, that intensity information if you have an optimal pixel volume. So if you have small events, you can discard that intensity information and do centroiding and still get extremely high data quality. Uh, one person had a very specific question about slide number 54. There's a row about motion correction at one EPS. Uh, what, what, what do we mean by that? Yeah, so um, essentially the idea here is if you want to do, uh, and uh, this shouldn't be uh, one EPS, this should be uh, one electron per pixel, not per second. Um, this should be one electron per pixel per frame. So the idea is to do motion correction where you're not interpolating between frames and you're not averaging multiple frames together. You need an exposure rate of something like one electron per pixel per frame. So you need to have sufficient dose in any frame that you can uh, do cross correlation from one frame to the next. You have contrast in every frame that you can cross correlate and, and do the motion correction. If you have a very fast readout from the camera, but that readout has to have very sparse frames. Essentially, every frame is so noisy due to shot noise that you can't do motion correction. And so what you have to do is average a bunch of frames together in order to, uh, to get enough contrast to do motion correction. So that's what these other cameras are doing. They read out much faster. The Falcon 4 EC reads out at 250 frames per second, the K3 at 75 frames per second. They read out very quick. But no one is actually doing uh, uh, cross correlation on each of those individual frames to do motion correction. Instead, what you do is you average multiple frames together and then you do motion correction and maybe you do some interpolation then to, to get back to the, the frame rate of the camera. With Apollo, if you can use a bright beam, you have signal in each of these individual frames. You don't need to average multiple frames together. And that means that you don't need to interpolate the motion. You can actually measure the motion in each frame, and especially for cryo-EM where you're looking at bursts of motion at the beginning, the first couple of frames, something that 
uh, Richard Henderson and, and Chris Russo, for instance, have been working very hard on. Um, being able to use a bright beam means that you can actually visualize motion at high frame rate uh, and correct it uh, without having to do interpolation. And so we're, we're excited about where this could go in terms of pushing data quality for cryo EM. Uh, I have a question about uh, does the chip read frames or, or the events from each pixel? Yeah, so um, the actual architecture of the of the sensor is is interesting. It it really reads events from each pixel, but um, the way it's architected is that it reads what's called event blocks, and so the the sensor is broken up into um, into small segments. Um, it's uh, excuse me, it's about four pixels by sixteen pixels. Uh, physical pixels is is an event block, and uh, basically those event blocks are seeing did any of the pixels within this block recognize an event and if so it reads out that entire event block so um, the sensor encodes these events based on these event blocks so it's it's not reading out whole frames it's really reading out events but it's it's a bit of a, a complicated way that it, it works because of the the event block okay. architecture uh, can you elaborate further on the super resolution um, do you still improve resolution by a factor of two in both directions but not more in view of the excellent otherwise performances of the detector, can't you push the computation for a further improved localization of the incoming electron? Yeah, so um, so uh, the super resolution, the way that I've done it with, with everything that I've shown here, I always showed with respect to physical Nyquist. So we essentially perform a Fourier cropping after the fact um, and to get back to, to, uh, to uh, standard resolution. That's relatively uh, common. Um, but the, uh, the uh, option is to read out full super resolution frames from the detector. Um, what happens though in the super resolution area is that the, the MTF and the DQE both continue to decline just like any of the other cameras that read out super resolution. And so you do get signal out there if you take uh, graphite or something like that. Um, you, can, you can clearly see the graphite ring in the super resolution region. Um, but it, you start to get diminishing returns. And so for a lot of people doing the Fourier cropping is, is uh, a good way to maximize your data quality while also um, keeping data sizes okay. low. Um, uh, one question is, is can we collect the ED or some electron diffraction data sets? So I guess this would be micro ED applications or other electron diffraction. Yeah, so um, you certainly could collect microED with Apollo, but you would need to really limit the exposure rate on the camera. Um, we've been able to, uh, uh, well, our customers have been doing microED uh, with our DE64 camera, for instance. Um, and uh, there was a paper that came out from Yana uh, uh, Kurasan in, uh, at Riken, uh Spring 8, showing microED from, uh, from a DE64 and showing a dramatic improvement in the, the signal-to-noise of diffraction spots with a direct detector compared to an indirect detector. Now, if you look at his, uh, his data and you look at the frames read out uh, from the DE64, the diffraction spots get up to 700 electrons per pixel per second in, in terms of the tens intensity. So the way that they collected their data would be much too bright for Apollo. 60 to 100 electrons per pixel per second is still not enough to accommodate microED unless you really limit the dose. And so that's one reason that we are continuing to offer the DE16 and DE64 cameras. There are still important reasons that those cameras are good detectors for material science, for microED, for very large viruses where you really want 8K by 8K physical pixels like David, uh, um, David Bella is doing at Glasgow, things like that. So Apollo is not replacing those other cameras. There are very important applications for those. But Apollo is really geared towards single particle and tomography. Um, it's probably not the best for microED because it can't quite accommodate that high exposure rate unless you're really, really limiting the dose. We've got a couple of people asking about how, how to go faster. Um, uh, the, you know, is, is it possible to get these, uh, these electron events streamed into the, streamed into the, uh, into the hard drive by employing other, uh, by employing other strategies, uh, higher temporal, basically to, us, to achieve higher temporal resolution beyond 60 frames per second. Yeah. So, um, yes, that is possible. Um, the, uh, there are, uh, the hardware supports uh, even faster frame rates to the computer um, through some compression techniques that we're developing. Um, at the moment, 60 frames per second is, is what we have. Um, 
certainly uh, our company is is very R and D focused. So we're always looking at pushing not only uh, completely new technologies, but also pushing the existing technology. So squeezing more out of what we have. So I expect that in the future, we'll be able to go even faster in terms of the dose fractionated frame rate or, or on chip compression uh, happening, things like that. Those things are certainly possible, um, but we really wanted to get this in people's hands immediately um, because it, it's already incredibly powerful as it is. And then we, yeah, we expect further improvements as, okay. as time goes on. Uh, several people are asking, we, you know, we, we, in, we indicate that it's a lower cost. Uh, some people are asking what, well, what is the price? Uh, because we have different distributor, uh, distributor channels in different parts of the world, different ones in Europe as opposed to the US, uh, we'll follow up individually. Uh, rough estimate is that it's about half the price of the current most popular camera on the market. Um, but the best thing to do is you can click on request a quote and we have a record of the chat and we can follow up with you individually. Um, we can't get to all the questions. Uh, we're already about six minutes over on the time. So what we'll do is we will uh, respond to people individually on some of these questions. I wanted to uh, thank everybody for joining and uh, we, we hope to see you soon. Hopefully we'll have some actual in-person events by the end of 2021. So thank you. Yeah, we'd love to start you in person again. And uh, we'll <laughs> thank talk you. to you later. Have a good Bye. afternoon.